Good morning from Trinity Episcopal Church in Boonville. We hope you'll enjoy our spiritual offering of music and the sermon of Mother Linda Logan for the 13th Sunday after Pentecost. to your children pray. Lord, send your spirit in this place. Lord, listen to your children praying. Send us love, send us power, send us grace. Instead of just preaching to you this morning, I would tell you a story. After all, Jesus told stories. Jesus is still telling stories to anyone who will listen. So I thought I would join the flow and jump in the stream, if not of his consciousness, at least of his approach. A long, long time ago, in a mindset not really so far away, a people were rejoicing because God finally had a house. The people knew that God didn't have a body that needed a stove to cook on or a bed to lie down on, but God had been wandering with them in their wilderness leading them on by the fire that burned within them, and a presence that clung like clouds of dew around them. And God had led them to a city where they might dwell. In fact, God had led them to more than just one city. 
God had led them to a land where they had become a people. And on the way, God had led them into an understanding of what constitutes a people, respect and care for each other, and respect for and awe toward that which gives them life. They had become a people with a land and a king, and the king had become mighty, slaying the enemy and bringing more land and wealth into the empire. And throughout a good part of this people's development, so the story goes, they carried with them a box, a wooden chest most likely, and inside that box were two pieces of stone on which was written the law or teaching of God. Or at least this is what people think the box contained. But it was all so very long ago that people don't really know what the box housed. But because it was believed that the box housed the words of God, the box was treated as something holy, like our Bible. We believe it houses words of God. So we regard it, a book, as holy. Well, this box was believed to contain the law through which the people had entered with God into covenant. So the box was called the Ark of the Covenant, because an ark is just a container of indeterminate size. It is not necessarily a boat full of animals, as in the story of Noah. The Hebrew words in the story, which are translated as ark, just mean box or chest. And this box was small enough to carry around by means of poles which attached to the sides of the box. So the box, which was believed to carry the words of God, went with the people as they journeyed. And as the people camped in tents, so the box rested in a tent. And because of what the ark contained, because of the presence the ark's contents manifested, the ark itself was virtually identified with God. So it was that when the people had become a nation and their king had become great and had built himself a great house, the king desired to build a house for the ark of God. But God reserved that right for the son of the king. No one knows why. Perhaps it was because God believed that that son would grow up to be wise. And when that son succeeded in building a house for the ark, and the ark was placed in the innermost room of the house, in the sanctuary, the most holy place, the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. The glory of the Lord penetrated that house like a cloud of moisture fills the air, and the presence of the Lord hung like clouds of dew in that innermost room. And the king's son, who had by that time become the king himself, stood before the altar of the Lord and prayed in the presence of all the people. And it was a most remarkable prayer, for after thanking God 
for keeping covenant and steadfast love with the people, and after thanking God for keeping the covenant with the king's father, that a successor of his would sit on the throne, the king said these words, But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Even heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, much less this house that I have built. And then the king went on to pray that God's eyes might be open night and day toward this house. Oh, the king said to God, here in heaven your dwelling place. This is remarkable, this prayer the king prayed. For this king was the king of a people who had left Egypt two or three hundred years before and had followed Moses into this land of God's promise and through their years of wandering had carried with them a box that was holy with the words of God within it. This king was the king who was allowed by God to build a house for the ark that was considered so holy with God's presence that people had been afraid at times to have that box within their city. This king had built a house for this ark in order to honor God's presence with the people. But even in the prayer of thanksgiving he gave, in celebration of the ark's coming at last into its own house, which he had built, the king acknowledged that even heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain God much less this house that he himself had built. How wise that king was! What understanding he had! And to think that he lived three thousand years ago! For even people today sometimes don't understand the real nature of that ark. People today sometimes don't understand that God can't be contained, whether it is in an ark or any other symbol. And they think that because they have experienced God in one set of circumstances or in one set of words or in one set of actions that they've got God, as it were, all boxed up and ready to carry with them. Now, mixed in with this thought is really a love for God because we all do want God to go with us. We all have a need to contain God. But what sometimes takes us a long time to understand is that we already do. For God is always with us, and God goes with us wherever we go. The ark was just a symbol of God's presence with the people. For it was God who camped with the people wherever they camped, and it was God who marched with the people wherever they marched. 
And although God did let Solomon build a house for the ark, and God did indeed fill that innermost room with God's presence, the houses and rooms that God prefers to fill are simply the people that fill the earth. For God's dearest preference is to dwell within us. Countless people have realized this. And a thousand years after Solomon, a man writing about Jesus, took that word dwell and expressed the understanding of his people that where God dwelled was in Jesus. And where God dwells is in people who themselves dwell in Jesus, which is to say, live in his spirit, live in his way of living, which is focused on other people and their needs, and which is, at its heart, a trusting relaxation into God. Where does God dwell? This is the question that the story of the Ark of the Covenant addresses. It's the question that the people of the Covenant asked long ago. And it's the question that people today also ask. And the answer is, in the words and experiences in which we encounter deep truth and peace and love, and in the words and experiences in which other people encounter deep truth and peace and love. But most of all, God dwells in people. God dwells in all the people who are trying to dwell in God. Remember this as you go out and encounter the world. Remember this as you sit and encounter yourself. My God, my Father, what a stray far from my home. Oh,
have been listening to a spiritual offering from Trinity Episcopal Church, located on Schuyler Street in Boonville. We're glad to be part of your day, and we invite you to join us in person for our weekly service at 9 o'clock Sunday mornings.